And the first study, the first study was t- which which one was that? The first study was uh, looking at a high dose of psilocybin and comparing it to a, a fairly high dose of methylphenidate or Ritalin under under very deeply blinded uh, conditions. So it was a good study because you used an active placebo, so to speak. Did you have a placebo in there as well, or was it methylphenidate versus psilocybin? It was just straight up comparing methylphenidate and psilocybin, but under deeply blinded conditions where people knew that in the course of two or three sessions, they would have at least one session in which they would get a dose of psilocybin, uh, but they were also told that they could get, I think it was 13 other psychoactive compounds. We recruited in only people who had zero prior experience with psychedelics. So because the allegedly the the profile of subjective effects are so unique uh, that it that uh, people could unblind themselves by taking in naive people we also uh, uh, eliminated a potential recruitment bias of people who were just, right. had good experiences so we could how, actually how did you convince the ethics committees that it was acceptable to, to, first of all, to do this at all, and, and also the administrators at your university, and second, that it was acceptable to use naive uh, participants. Yeah. <laughs> why, did, why did they, why did they, and do you think that in today's climate, do you think that that study would now be possible if, well, let's say if you hadn't laid the groundwork for it? You know, <laughs> I, I think partly it was uh, good luck, and partly it uh, it actually s- it speaks very well of Johns Hopkins and their ethic review uh, procedures. So when I assembled that uh, protocol with some help from the Council on Spiritual Practices and counseling from Bob Jesse, when I s- assembled that protocol, I actually thought that there's probably less than a 50% chance it would even be approvable. Because because of these, you know, ethical committees, it has to go through, you know, not only the Hopkins Ethical Committee, but FDA and and FDA hadn't approved a study giving a high dose of a psychedelic to a psychedelic naive individual for, I I don't know, you know, 25 plus years, decades. Uh, And uh, and so it was no means clear that it would even uh, even go, but but it was so interesting to me. And as I said, I was losing lo- losing comparative interest in the other things that I was doing that I thought, well, you know, why not? Um, the the ethical scrutiny that that got was as was unlike, as you might imagine, unlike any, previous protocol or even any protocol since. It went through many levels of scrutiny within uh, my institution, Johns Hopkins, including being looked at by the dean and the managing attorney's office and and whatever. And I and I'm I have to say I'm very proud of Johns Hopkins as an institution. It's stunning that they did it. I I can't believe that they did it. I, I can't what 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 arguments did you marshal? To, to put up against, because I mean, it's so easy for a committee to, if they see risk, just to say no, because no is simple. The problem goes away and no one's accountable for it. Yes, yes is complicated. And so like, how did you convince them this was a worthwhile endeavor, especially given your own skepticism at that point? Well, it really came down to uh, a science and risk benefit ratio. I think the big risk that most institutions would have caved in on is a political risk, a reputational risk. You know what? You know, to be associated with psychedelics, look, that yeah, got Harvard. Well, look Harvard what Leary in. did for Harvard. Yeah, exactly. And But uh, the committee at Hopkins that looked at this uh, really put the, pol- the politics to one side and and weighed the risk benefit ratio to uh, to the volunteers. What did they see as the benefit? 
Oh, uh, in terms of just understanding the the nature, let's see, we put it forward as a comparative pharmacology study. Okay. And so, and we had done a lot of work with comparative pharmacology. And in fact, I had a grant from the National Institute on Drug Abuse to compare what one of my specialties at the time was sedative hypnotics. And, and I had a, a grant that had proposed to compare ketamine, which is an NMDA dissociative anesthetic, with some other uh, compounds. And, um, and so I, I, I modified it uh, to say, well, we were going to look at ketamine, but I think we'll look at psilocybin. And instead of comparing mm-hmm. it to a classic... Okay, so there Other was some incrementalism there because ketamine's already like radically psychoactive, although perhaps not so much as a pure psychedelic, let's say. So there was some incrementalism and, and you'd already got support from granting agencies and, and you had all your credibility behind you. Yeah. And and so what we could what we could argue is we're we're looking at relative abuse potential uh, here. Now the study as it's published doesn't read out as that, but that that was really uh, how it was designed as a classic comparative pharmacology study in which we could compare the effects of psilocybin to methylphenidate in healthy volunteers. We had, you know, we could look at things right. like and so li- that's, liking. That's, that's, you can, I can see that that would be, you could make a mount of per, per straightforward, valid scientific argument for that. You have methylphenidate, which is a standard psychomotor stimulant, basically dopaminergically mediated, something like cocaine. And then you have this strange psychedelic and the, the reason they're addictive is not, or if they are, and of course there's tremendous discussion about that, but they, they don't fit neatly into the category of other abusable drugs. And so that, that is an issue that's worthy. It's very hard to get animals to voluntarily take psychedelics at least regularly, whereas you can do it with cocaine with no problem. So I can see that that there, you can make a basic science argument right there. And, say, and you said also abuse potential. Okay, 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 fair, fair enough. I'm still stunned that they managed it, but but, well. <laughs> but it's so interesting to see how much work and preparation and care at all sorts of levels had to go into that before it was made possible. And it, it's also even possible that maybe that caution was warranted because one of the things that really strikes me about your research program is that it hasn't got out of hand, right? I mean, and that's what happened in Harvard in the early 60s when Leary started playing around, let's say, with LSD, which you don't play around with. Um, you've been able to really keep this within a tightly bound scientific box while still um, investigating and popularizing the the reality of the mystical experience for the participants. Okay, so you you started the study. You had naive people. What happened? Um, well, <laughs> what happened is uh, is the story that actually changed my career direction because the results. You know, I was interested in. Uh, spiritual experience. Uh, I, I put in questionnaires into this study that had been used to measure naturally occurring mystical experiences. And Ralph Hood, who may have been a participant in the meeting that we went to. I think we met Ralph there. Yep. Yeah. Had a, a nice questionnaire. Um, you know, but I, I wasn't sure what to entirely what to expect, and and whether uh, the effects would would live up to the what struck me as uh, exaggerated claims uh, by uh, the psychedelic and enthusiast uh, populations. Uh, but indeed, what happened was uh, under these blinded conditions and both the guides were blinded and the volunteers to what what drugs were administered uh, uh, other than on some session that get a dose of of psilocybin uh, and um, and what emerges number one that uh, immediately during these sessions that are done uh, after careful preparation, so they're they're really curated experiences in which we meet with volunteers for eight preparation hours prior to the session, and then they come in, they take a capsule, 
there, we ask them to lay on a couch for the duration of the session, which can be up to eight hours, six to eight hours. We encourage them to use blind folds uh, so that their uh, so that their visual system is cut off. We have them use um, earphones through which they listen to a program of of music and so it's an introvertive kind of do they experience. select the music or do you select it we select it what were your guidelines for selecting the music well uh our our main guide who played a, a very important role in our initial study was uh bill richards and he had actually done psychedelic work at uh, maryland research center back in the 1970s uh, and so he had a, a strong bias toward Western uh, classical music. And so our initial playlist was very strongly influenced in that direction. Since that time... Any particular composers? Like, was it heavy on Bach, for example? When it, well, not particularly heavy, but it, it, it yeah, it covered... Uh, it covered a, a, a range of, of uh, classical composers. Uh, See, I, I'm focusing on that because, I mean, <laughs> music and dancing are components of psychedelic experiences that stretch back tens of thousands of years. And so the fact that I mean, it's easy to skip over these details in some sense, you had people lay down, their eyes were closed. Okay, so they're not, they're not having a sociological experience of psilocybin. They're having an interior experience, and then you use music, and God only knows what music does in it, in the final analysis. But um, and it's it's certainly the case that that you know there isn't a tremendous amount of space between classical music and religious music, and so so there's all sorts of things that you've done that are implicit in the uh, experiment that are integral in some some indeterminate sense to the outcome. Now, these preparation sessions, eight hours. Okay, what are you doing with people during those eight hours and why? Let's see, the preparation is, is, is uh, really developing rapport and trust with them. These, these experiences are, can be hugely disorienting and they, and, uh, fear, anxiety can arise in at at very strong magnitude. It's very important that people feel safe and cared for. So, I think of it that we're trying to create a container around these experiences. They have to trust their. We sometimes they're called guides or sitters. They really have to implicitly trust these people to to take care of them. You've probably heard by now that you should be using a VPN when you connect to the internet. But if you're like me, adding an extra step to anything you do every day just sounds like a hassle. Well, let me tell you, if you knew how easy it was to protect your connection with ExpressVPN, you'd be doing it already. ExpressVPN is the easiest way to browse safely, securely, and it's just better. ExpressVPN gets rid of all those things you hate about VPNs. It's a VPN done right. First of all, it's blazing fast. Lots of other VPNs slow your connection to the point where it's not even worth it to connect. But ExpressVPN doesn't lag or buffer. You can stream in HD with no issues. And using it couldn't be easier. Just open the ExpressVPN app, click one button, and enjoy instant protection across all of your devices. The fact is, once you connect to ExpressVPN, you don't even realize you have it on. No wonder it's been called the best VPN by CNET. Right now, go to expressvpn.com slash jordanyt. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash jordanyt and get three extra months free. Expressvpn.com slash jordanyt. Okay, so you want them to be open and let it go and let it happen. And you say, we'll take care of you, but you can let it happen. Yeah, le yeah let it go, be open, trust, you know, and, and we... And we prepare them uh, to not necessarily expect, but uh, but not rule out the possibility that what may emerge in during the session is something that they'll find absolutely terrifying or anxiety producing. Okay, so they know that. Oh, oh, absolutely. Okay, okay, okay. And so I almost. And how often do people encounter 
so I mean, the experiences are exceptionally profound and range across the full range of emotional significance. In, in fact, past the normal ranges of emotional significance. So how frequently in the experience is the negative end of the human experience magnified? Um, actually, quite frequently. So in our, in our first study, about 30% of volunteers would have said, actually rated it at the end of the study, that sometime during the experience they had an experience of fear of, or anxiety that they would rate it extreme. Now, very often those are short-lived experiences, and to the extent that they drag out over long periods of the session, uh, the outcomes are going to generally be less uh, less favorable. But I, I think it's, a, it's actually a very sobering statistic that in spite of all the selection we do, I mean, we've already screened out people f for whom we don't think we can develop rapport and trust. We've screened out uh, individuals, um, uh, you know, with borderline personality disorder, for instance. Uh, and so, and and so, we've already selected a group of people who are open and curious. Uh, we're giving them all this time and attention. Yet, about thirty percent will experience some significant anxiety during those sessions. What's important is that it's very, very rare for anyone who has a session of uh, under these kinds of conditions to report after the session that they feel as though uh, their life satisfaction, you know, has been decreased. Most people, even if they have a difficult experience, will interpret that experience in a context of meaningfulness. And, and in some cases, it's actually through the doorway of the, uh, the, the most difficult portions of the experience that the greatest learning comes up. So let, let's let's dive into that a little bit. I mean, I know historically, I know it, it appears as though historically when people were preparing for experiences of this sort, that they would often go undergo a process of of ritual purification. And and I, I'm gonna just abandon the ritual part of that and assume that what they were doing was attempting some moral purification, that they were settling their accounts, that they were trying to ensure that they didn't walk into the experience with with karmic, excessive karmic baggage that they could conceivably shed, that they were very careful to prepare themselves so that their consciences weren't weighing on them any more heavily than they needed to. And when people undergo these negative experiences, but still emerge, uh, let's say, with the judgment that that was worthwhile, what What's the essential nature of the negative experience? I mean, I mean, it's not contentless terror. It's 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 not that in, unformed. It's more personal. We, well, the interesting piece of it, Jordan, is that it can take many, many different forms. Uh, so, um, so you know, one example that we give is because psilocybin. Is a, so it very often has a lot of visualizations attached to it, either uh, uh, either imagery and sometimes realistic imagery or patterns or whatever. And, we, and so we'll say, well, for instance, if and this can happen, uh, if during the session uh, a demonic figure you know comes up and starts to approach you. Um, your your job is to be interested and curious about it, to recognize that this is a display of consciousness. We will, we'll often say there's nothing in consciousness per se that can hurt you. And and what you what we want you to be is interested in this. And so instead of reifying an image if in your mind so take the demon instead of reifying it and if you do you'll either choose to run from it and then you'll spend the entire session running from this demon that's going to annihilate you until you're exhausted and the psilocybin's gone 
Or alternatively, you may choose to fight it, but, but by fighting it, you've also reified it. Uh, and what we really want you to do is be really interested in it and be curious about it. And so it's terrifying. It's, it's a construct created by you for you, probably to, ter to, to terrify you uh, and uh, be interested in it and, and curious about it. And, and it's through that recognition, through although the hair on the back of your head may be standing on end, you know, we would much rather have you approach it uh, and in effect ask it what it's doing there. What, what, what am I to learn from this? And what the guarantee is, is that what, whatever the nature of that is, and it can take any number of forms and it's not necessarily a monster or just visual, but whatever it is, is not, is not going to be static. I mean, unless you reify it, <laughs> unless, unless you make it static, if you actually investigate it, it's going to start changing. And then initially, it actually might become more terrifying, uh, but it can't, it can't and won't continue to do that. It's going to dissolve and it may dissolve into something disgusting or beautiful or transcendent or silly. Uh, but it's going to change. And, and your job is just to stay with the experience and recognize that you're empowered in a way to approach whatever it is that emerges in consciousness. And my, my own sense, I'd be, and I'd be very curious about how you interpret this from a clinical psychological uh, point of view. But my, my sense of that is that that's a hugely empowering experience for people to have, that they have literally faced the dragon. They have faced the greatest terror, whatever form it's taken, and, they, and they've come out recognizing that they're, they're safe, they're empowered. And that, and that, that can be a, a life-changing experience in and of itself. Because after you really have been there with the with the, the the demon, the worst demon of your dreams, and faced it down and and looked it in its eyes and realized it's actually nothing other than an object of consciousness, nothing other than yourself, then what is it in life that can put up an obstacle w with that much uh, fear? Uh, for you, it's it's very much like a classic initiation ceremony. I mean, the yeah. I mean, one thing that clinicians have agreed upon, regardless of their school of thought, let's say, is that voluntary exposure to what to obstacles in your path that are f threatening or disgusting is almost inevitably cur curative, and. It seems that the rule is that that which you approach voluntarily shrinks as you approach it and you grow. And, and if you run, the reverse happens. And you can play that out very straightforwardly if you're a behaviorist, because if someone's afraid of an elevator, then you have them stand 10 feet from the elevator and then 9 feet and then 8 feet. And not only do they learn that what they learn is that they can withstand the fear. That's what generalizes. And you don't get symptom substitution the way the psychoanalysts thought, because you're probably not counter conditioning the fear. What you're doing is showing the person that there's more to them than they thought. And, and there isn't anything more salutary than that. And that is precisely why you're encouraged, let's say, in mythological stories to confront the dragon and get the gold. Um, that, that's the basic story. And it's, and the, the, it's very interesting how that becomes portrayed in a psychedelic experience.